The following program contains adult content and sexual themes. Viewer discretion is advised. And it contains murder. Lots and lots of murder. <laughs> Stinking bastard. People tell me, hey, you're gonna go die and go to hell. At least I'm not alone. Time for 911. Where's your emergency? Oh, this is Sandy. We're pretty one. Look, Black Send the police. Send the police. Hey guys, don't be a hero, mate. I said I'm not trying to be a hero, but the police are coming. One in the chest, one in the head. Fired by Detective Sergeant Roger Rogerson. I was uh, branching out, that's when the cannibalism started, eating of the heart and uh, the arm muscle. Oh, I would have nailed Carl Williams' hands for a coffee table with this and just pulled it out of his backside. Carl Williams is a wobbly bottom little cher cherub of face, cherub face little boy who would, who, who would, who, whose, whose life would be... I harm someone each time I kill someone, there'd be an enormous amount, uh, especially at first, an uh, enormous amount of horror, guilt, remorse afterwards, but then that impulse to do it again would come back even stronger. Welcome to another episode of Bloody Murder. I'm Barney Black. And I'm Tara Saraban. We're going to talk some true crime. We're going to talk a lot of murder. We're going to talk a lot of murder. How has it been, Tara? Um, how's what been? The murder? The murder's been good. No, how's your life been? Oh, my life. Uh, well, not quite as good as the murder. Um, I somehow lost a part of my tooth the other day and I didn't even notice, so I must have eaten it. Um, so that's nice. Um, what about you? <laughs> uh, you know, I'm still lamenting my, my moustache trimming. Oh my God, it looks the same to me. It's like nah, less curly on the ends. I had a great moustache game a couple of weeks ago. I've trimmed it now and it's just... Um, <sighs> I think it's better to have had some good moustache game in your life than never have had it at all. I know. Look, at least you appreciated it when it was there, it and was, then you started whinging about how it wasn't as good. I and I was like, "Well, whinging. just cut it. Just cut it back well, to its former glory." I should glory. have left it. Why? Because it's I don't know. Yeah. You didn't like it. Look, it, I don't want to talk about mustache. it anymore. Oh my god! Bring up the mustache and then take the mustache off the table. Is this what you're doing? It's exactly what I'm doing. I heard you had a bad tram ride the other oh, day. Oh well, it wasn't bad. It was it was pretty funny actually. I got on one last night. Um, and, and I was just like in this, this dark, smelly, alcohol, sweat, smelly, um, Not your tram. own this time. Not my own. That, that was a problem. Fine with my own, not fine with other people's. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there were like four huge clean cut European guys yelling along at the top of their lungs to a Celine Dion song. Um, I think it was, oh. it's all coming back to me and you could tell they were European cause of the accents. And I was like, okay, this is weird. This is really weird. Um, but then You're the Voice by John Farnham was their next choice. And when anyone who isn't Australian knows that cheesy, cheesy song, I'm always incredibly surprised. So they yelled along to that. And then I was thinking of getting off the tram because it was so loud and smelly. Um, but I, I, I stuck it out and they got off eventually. They didn't seem threatening or dangerous. They just seemed smelly and loud and, and European. I like that film Hot Rod. That had good use of a John Farnham that song. That had a fantastic use of You're walking, the Voice. They're doing a little walk walk up yeah down the well i think it turns into a riot because they're not from australia they probably didn't have the same like john farnham saturation in their childhoods so i was thinking for that they must have just like gone through a lot of songs and tried to figure out which one was the cheesiest song oh, ever I, written oh i think some of those songs had were minor hits in the u.s yeah you're the voice yeah whispering jack what was the I'm one the convinced. wheels the wheels are turning or something age of reason no the other one I don't know. Get the wheels. Ah, oh, anyway. You don't know. I don't How know. How can I know when you don't know? I remember a friend of mine, Kirstine, um, had, had a <laughs> dance to it. You're outing Kirstine as a Farnham fan. Well, I, I didn't say her n or surname. <laughs> I'm so tempted to, but she would hate me forever. I'm sure there was some like substances involved that made that happen back hey, in the day. We've had some good feedback lately, and I just want to thank um, David for uh, tipping me on that last story. Oh, the right. Yemen... Um, Massacre, the Yemen genocide. Did he take the spider out of his mouth long enough to tell you about it? I think he might have. I think he has both <laughs> his legs and arms too. Yeah, yeah. I'm um, glad to hear about that. No more spiders. I don't want to be the spider girl. Now, you've got a great uh, death metal murder. De I do. Black metal, I should say. Yeah, it's black metal, except... Um, There's I'm, a difference. I might accidentally say death metal by accident. Um, this is the 1993 Norwegian black metal murder of Euronymous by Varg Vikernes. Um, I knew there was 
uh, black metal murder, but I didn't really know anything about it. So I checked, I checked it out, and it's um, it's pretty interesting. It's got people involved in it with names like Dead, Necro Butcher, and Hellhammer. 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 I like, that. I, I like this. I'd like to call a kitten that. Hellhammer, like a fluffy little Persian. Yeah. Come here, Hellhammer. Um, it'd be good in a dog park, yelling out Hellhammer to get your dog yeah, to come Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That would scare all the owners of the fluffy white dogs, but they're scared very easily. Um, anyway, to the uninitiated, all of this whole like black metal sounds the same. Um, but apparently there's been a great divide ever since this murder. So some people are on Team Euronymous and some people are on Team Varg. And if you were to go to like a black metal gig and you wear like the wrong team's T-shirt, you're liable, you're likely to get bashed. Sign of like UK football kind of thing. Um, yeah, maybe. I don't really I don't pay attention to that. Um, but yeah, it's a weird. It's like gangs. Sweet. Yeah. All right. So let's get into it. Uh, Christian Vikens, uh, Vikenes. Okay, so you know I can't pronounce anything ever, pretty much, because of my Australian accent and, I don't know, my, my, my tiny lady brain. Um, but I asked my Dutch friend Maritz how to pronounce this because I didn't have a Norwegian handy. And then he asked a Swedish girl because Sweden's closer to Norway. Um, mm. So that's where I'm getting the Vikenes from. Uh, he was born on the 11th of February in 1973. Uh, his name was Christian Vikernes at first, uh, but he later changed his name to Varg, which means wolf. Well, you can't be into black metal and your first name be Christian. Christian, yeah, it doesn't really work, does no. it? He was probably like, why didn't my parents call me Satan? That would have been so much better. Um, anyway, he released music under the name Burzum, uh, which means darkness in the black speech, which is a fictional language created by Lord of the Rings writer J.R.R. Tolkien. What do the R stand for? Um, I think he just really liked, was it Dallas and that J.R. character, Larry Hagman? And then he thought, I can't just have the same name as that character, even though it's the best character, and he just put another R in. I don't think that's true. I think it stands for Radish. Good. Yeah, that's, it's, that's actually true. Um, his uh, anyway, Varg Varg's stage name was Count Grishnak, um, which is taken from the name of an orc in the Two Towers. So loosely translated, this guy's name essentially means Moody Wolf. Mood no, doesn't mean wolf. There's no fishing. Moody Wolf Tolkien nerd. Ugh. That's what I'm getting from it. It's like you know I'm so evil and bad. I like Tolkien. Um, anyway, there's not a lot of clear factual information about Varg's childhood, but I managed to find some stuff. His mother worked for a large oil company and his father was an electronics engineer. So that says to me that his parents made some good money. Um, Vikernes says that when he was six years old, the family moved to Baghdad for a year because his father was working for Saddam Hussein. Nice. Um, yeah, he was developing computer programs, maybe just like fun games. Frogger. Oh, Frogger, Frogger in Iraq. Well, Iraqi. you can't develop something that's already developed unless Saddam wasn't aware that Frogger used to exist. It's possible. Yeah, that's a bit of a risk. But um, sure, let's go with it. That's what his dad did. Um, so Varg went to an Iraqi elementary school during this time and um, there weren't any places available in the English school in Baghdad. So he went to a, a proper Iraqi one. According to an interview, it was here that he became aware of racial matters. Corporal punishment was not uncommon in the school and on one occasion, Varg had a run-in with a teacher and called him a monkey. But as he perceived it, the teachers didn't dare to hit him because he was white. Mm, mm -hmm. mm. What about, okay, I was like terrified of authority when I was growing up. I had too much respect for it. I, I look back on that and I laugh in its face and then I cry. But um, what about you? I reckon you would have been an upstart who, who got some corporal punishment handed your way. Well, there was Because I feel like hitting you sometimes. Well, yeah. But you don't like right being now. hit. It's weird. I don't like being hit. I know. Um, What's wrong with you? Most people love it. Yeah, well, no, they love hitting you. It just makes a good noise. Uh, yeah, they had corporal punishment in my primary school. I once got the strap for, um, I used to turn the turn the power off for the whole school. <laughs> And I had this little hiding spot and I'd see the teacher come out, you know, looking around to see what's going on and then, you know, hit the breaker switch and then they figured out it was me. That's so Bart Simpson. And yeah, I got the strap for that. And I got the strap for spitting in a teacher's face once. You spat in their face? Well, I had I had a Coke and A Coke. A Coke. A Coca Cola. And uh That's what we call it here. I had a mouthful of that and they said something funny and I sprayed them in the face. Yeah, but 
that's that's like a party foul. That's it, not something you should get the cane I for. I kind of did it on purpose. As, oh, as okay. So that's really funny. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. So, yeah, I got the strap for that. But uh, no, I didn't have corporal punishment by the time I got to high school, which was good. Ah, yeah, I don't even know. I don't, mm. I don't think just they Just mentally they tortured us, really. Yeah, well, that's more like Catholic schools from what I've heard. Yeah, and of course the other students torture each other, so... Well, yeah, they do it for way, them. It's a way of the world. Yeah, it's a really nice, nice little situation we've got over here. Um, so anyway, Varg said that his father had a swastika flag at home. Oh, nice. Yeah, I mean, you know, some good graphic design. You'd appreciate that. Um, but he feels that his father was a hypocrite because he was worried about Varg being a Nazi, whereas he too was pissed off about all the coloured people he saw in town. Um, Vikanes says that his mother was very race conscious in the sense that she was afraid that he was going to come home with a black girl. So, yeah, this is all like tiptoeing around or stepping into some uh, racial issues that may or may not be relevant later. <laughs> Yeah, they, they will be. Um, anyway, his parents divorced when he was 11 or 12. And I just want to know who got custody of the uh, swastika flag. Hmm, That's a good question. Yeah. Well, I'm guessing it was his dad's, but maybe his mum owned it for years and his dad just like took it on. That happens. Anyway, there are claims that Vikanes was a skinhead before he became part of the black metal scene. Um, but a lot, of, a lot of his fans don't believe that because... The paganism stuff is very can sound very similar to the Nazi stuff, funnily enough. Um, yeah, so when asked in the Lords of Chaos interview whether he hung out with skinheads in Bergen, where he grew up, Varg replied there were no skinheads in Bergen. But he mentioned that he had short hair at the time and admired the Germans and hated the British and Americans. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's that's a thing. I've got short hair and I like Germans. I don't really hate British and Americans though. No. What do you like most about the Germans? Is is it their their outfits? Or are you talking about now? I just love the way they speak. It's really. It's ro- a pretty interesting it's, accent. It's pretty romantic. Romantic. <laughs> it's not the word I would use. It's so precise. But anyway, okay. Now I know that gets you hot. I'm going to set up some kind of practical joke. Um, so Varg had been playing guitar since he was 14 and he was involved with several bands before joining Mayhem. This is also the year, oh no, that doesn't work. Um, sorry, he joined Mayhem in, uh, 1992, which is also the year that he went on a bit of a church burning spree. Oh, nice. Yeah. Well, those churches are so big and beautiful. Those like old school churches, yeah. but, but you know, um, Varg, Varg burnt some down. It's only one thing that burns better than a church. An effigy. That's right. Uh-huh. Of I a knew church. that one. An effigy of a church. <laughs> yeah. An effigy of the band, the church. Um, so he was found guilty of burning down three churches in what many thought was an expression of Satanism for some reason. Um, but Varg saw the whole thing pretty differently. He said, I'm not going to say that I burnt any churches, but let me put it this way. There was one person who started it. That to me sounds a bit like he's gesturing at himself going, who's got two thumbs and started the church burning spree? This guy. Um, Anyway, he said, I was not found guilty of burning the Fantoff Stave Church. But anyway, that was what triggered the whole thing. That was the 6th of June and everyone linked it to Satanism. What everyone overlooked was that on the 6th of June in 793 in Lindisfarne in Britain was the site of the first known Viking raid in history with Vikings from Hordaland, which is my country. The Christians desecrated our graves, our burial mounds, so it's revenge. Way to hold a grudge for 1,200 years. I think the English got the rough end of the stick with that whole Viking thing anyway, didn't they? Um, I don't really know a hell of a lot about it. Lots of monks were set fire to and all that. Monks, yeah, but they burn as well as an effigy, so (laughs) maybe they were just trying to stay warm. Haven't you seen Vikings? Um, I've seen some of it. That's a documentary, you know. That's a documentary shot in real time. It is. I'm all about Lagatha. She's really cool. Um, but no, I stopped watching it because I get annoyed by period stuff right now. All the costumey shit. I don't know why. Right now, it's just not my scene. No, right. I'll come back around at some point. Also, the, the accents they use on that show, they kind of sound like they're talking like this, which well, just sounds at, daft to me. It least, doesn't sound the, European. Yeah, but at least they're not using their American accents. Well, that's because most of them aren't American. <laughs> A lot of them are. Yeah, okay. Some Australians as well. And, I, think, um, um, I love the hair. Swedish. Well, the hair's pretty cool. Lagatha's hair is pretty sweet. Yeah, that's true. Anyway, in, in 92, as I said, um, Varg Vikernes joined the band Mayhem with Einstein Arseth, who went by the pseudonym Euronymous, 
which was derived from the demon Uranomus. No, can't. That's bad. Um, Uranomus. Uranomus. There you go. It's easy when you say it. Um, so anyway, Euronymous was a Norwegian guitarist and a founder of and central figure in the early Norwegian black metal scene. Do you have any more on Euronymous? Yeah, of course. Oh, no, you mean the demon or the guy? Yeah, the demon. Um, uh, <laughs> what was his name again? Fuck you, Barney, <laughs> I believe is what it translates to in English. Um, so anyway, uh, Euronymous was the co-founder of Mayhem and the owner of the extreme metal ra- metal record label Death Like Silence Productions um, and a shop called Helvet, which means hell. Oh, so I thought it might have been a font shop. A font shop. You would like that. Isn't Helvetica your favourite font? I do like fonts and Helvetica is pretty good. Oh, it's not your favourite anymore? <sighs> it used to be totally your favourite. Yeah, I like Din Schriften. That actually sounds like a lounge singer's name. It does, doesn't it? Um. Anyway, so thematically... Euronymous, really, he had a theme going on for this. Anyway, he lived with his mayhem bandmates, Necro Butcher and Dead. <laughs> I love their names. Um, according to Necro Butcher, Dead and Euronymous got on each other's nerves a lot and weren't really friends at the end. Mayhem drummer Hellhammer said that Dead went outside to sleep in the woods once because Euronymous was playing synth music that Dead hated. Euronymous then went outside and began shooting into the air with a shotgun. Well, if you can think of a sound that goes better with synth than shotgun fire, I personally would like to hear about it. Mm, Probably farts. Farts. (laughs) I can imagine you doing a synth fart remix. Um, Anyway, there's rumours that Euronymous also stabbed Dead at some point. Poor Dead. Dead was not long for this world. On the 8th of April 1991, at the age of 22, Dead committed suicide at the house they shared. Uh, He slit his wrists and shot himself in the head with a shotgun. I mean, he's thorough. I'm going to give him points for that. Euronymous was the one who found him. Before calling the police, he went to a shop and bought a disposable camera and photographed Dead's dead body because that's what friends do. Wow. Do you think that's bad? Uh, He later used one of these photographs as the cover of a bootleg live Mayhem album called Dawn of the Black Hearts. Yeah, you showed me that picture. I know. It's graphic. Like his brains are blowing out. Yeah. Um, So that's real. It kind of looks... So fake that you know it's real, kind yeah. of thing, you know. <laughs> I um, I'm kind of amazed that that's allowed to happen, but okay. Um, anyway, this is how Necro Butcher remembers Euronymous telling him about the suicide. Uh, he called me up the next day and he says, "Dead has done something really cool. He killed himself." I thought, "Have you lost it? What do you mean cool?" And he said, "Relax. I have photos of everything." Oh, well, that's good. Yeah, relax. I got photos of everything. Um, I was in shock and grief and he was just thinking how to exploit it. So I told him, okay, don't even fucking call me before you destroy those pictures or put them on the album cover, which is what ended up happening. I guess they talked that one out. Uh, Euronymous used Dead Suicide as a marketing ploy to play up Mayhem's evil image and claimed that Dead had killed himself because black metal had become too commercial. Well, I was going to say, but... Yeah, you were just like, too commercial, yeah. time to go. Mm. Poor Dead. Apparently he's seen as a bit of a Kurt Cobain type figure. Right. For some reason. I don't see the parallels. My se- no, obviously there's parallels. Uh, Rumours spread that Euronymous had made a stew with bits of Dead's brain and had made necklaces with bits of his skull. The band later said that the stew thing was completely ridiculous, but confirmed the making of the necklaces. Uh, Euronymous claimed to have given these necklaces to musicians that he deemed worthy, like some kind of stone-cold asshole friendship bracelet. Wow, I want one. You want one? You want a piece of Dead's fucking skull in a necklace? Would you wear that? Sure. Because your birthday's coming up and I need to think it of is. something. It is, 12th of May. Yeah? Okay, yeah. I'll see what I can do. <laughs> that might be difficult to source. <laughs> Um, so, hey, the Euronymous took Vicanus, who was five years under, under the... Okay. It's not ha- too much coffee? Not enough coffee. Not enough coffee. Something's going on here. My mouth has just given up on me, like everyone else. <laughs> okay, Euronymous took Varg Vicanus, who was five years younger than him, under his wing and invited him to play bass in his band Mayhem. He also offered to release his music as Burzum on his record label. Unfortunately, it didn't take long for their friendship to turn to rivalry, and Vicanus clearly didn't trust Euronymous as far as he could throw him, which totally kind of makes sense in light of this whole dead thing. 
On the night of the 10th of August 1993, Vikernes drove from Bergen to Euronymous's apartment in Oslo. Shortly after arriving, a confrontation began and Vikernes fatally, Vikernes fatally stabbed Euronymous. His body was found on the stairs outside the apartment with 23 stab wounds. Two to the head, five to the neck, and 16 in the stink. Um, 16 to the back. Right. Um, nasty. Nasty. Stabby. Um, what's interesting, though, is that um, Varg Vigernes offered his side of the story on his website. Oh, so, I've got to hear this. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to like read what he said went down. According to his friends, the plan was to meet me, knock me out with a stun gun, tie me up and put me in the trunk of a car. This is Euronymous he's talking about. Mm. He would then drive into the countryside, tie me to a tree and torture me to death while videotaping everything. See, I feel like that's something he might have done. Yeah, that does sound like, <laughs> like I mean, I don't know if it's true. Um, my reaction to this was naturally anger. What the hell did he think he was? The same day, I decided to drive to Oslo, hand him a signed contract and tell him to fuck off. Basically, and um, by doing so, take away all the excuses that he had to contact me ever again. He was going to end it. Euronymous was waiting for me in the entrance, looking very nervous, and I handed them the contract. After a few seconds, he jumped from the floor and dashed for the kitchen. I knew he had a, life, a knife lying on the kitchen table and I figured that if he's going to have a knife, I'm going to have a knife too. Why don't we all have a knife? That knife's for everybody. Um, I jumped out in front of him and managed to stop him before he got his hands on the kitchen knife. At this point, he had showed his intentions. So when he ran for the bedroom, I figured he was going for another weapon. He had some weeks earlier told some people that he would soon get the shotgun back from the police which is the one dead used to shoot himself. So I figured that that's what he was going for or he was going for his stun gun. Although he actually didn't have a stun gun or the shotgun in his apartment, but I didn't know that. I gave chase, stabbed him and was a bit surprised when he ran out of the apartment instead. It made no sense to flee and it made me angry to know that he had started the fight, but the moment it didn't go his way, he decided to flee instead, instead of fighting like a man such is always something I have disliked strongly. That's a good quote. Do it again. Such is always something I have disliked strongly. Hmm. Um, yeah, so I finished him off by thrusting the knife through his skull, through his forehead, and he died instantaneously. The eyes turned around in his head and a moan could be heard as he emptied his lungs when he died. He fell down to a sitting position, but the knife was stuck in his head, so I held him up as I held onto the knife. When I jerked the knife from his skull, he fell forward and rolled down a flight of stairs like a sack of potatoes, making enough noise to wake up the whole neighbourhood. So that's his recount, Varg Veganess's recount. Sounds um, like self-defence to me. Well, does it ever sound like Euronymous ever had a weapon? No, it doesn't no. sound like he stood a chance, actually. Yeah, yeah, it sounds like there's some paranoia, possibly. Um, also, what no one's mentioning is drugs, but I can imagine there might have been some. Yeah. Anyway, that's, um, that's the murder. Upon Vikernes' arrest in 1993, police discovered a stockpile of 150 kilograms of explosives and 3,000 rounds of ammunition in his home. It's speculated that he was planning a terrorist attack to blow up Blitz House, which is an Oslo anti-fascist organisation. He could have just had it to, you know, for a party maybe. For a party, maybe. Bring in the new year. Maybe he's one of those guys that gets his Christmas presents organised in advance. That's right. Explosives and ammunition for all the family mm. this year. Um, so on May 16th, 1994, um, Varg was sentenced to 21 years in prison. And that's Norway's maximum penalty. You can't, you can't get more than that. Um, so that was kind of a catch-all for the murder of Euronymous, the arson of the three churches, the attempted arson of a fourth church, and for the theft and storage of explosives and ammunition. While in prison, he wrote several books that could be said to espouse European white supremacist ideologies, including Teutonic mythology and worldview and the religion of the blood. Um, I watched part of an interview with him when he was in prison, and i got to say that they ever want to put me away, I request that I go to jail in Norway. Um, he had a room with a window in it. The window wow. Had, yeah, the window had bars on it, but it looked essentially like a normal bedroom. Um, and he had a computer... And he was wearing a silly houndstooth Sherlock Holmes style hat, which is everything I could want from oh, prison that's, life. Oh, that's prison issue in Norway. In Norway, you have to wear the hat. Yeah, they uh. all dress them like Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> right. Is that some kind of like ironic thing? And do all of yeah. the like prison guards dress like baddies? 
Sure, they dress like Moriarty. I don't know where I'm going with this. Your knowledge of Norway has always been profound. Absolutely. Um, so while on prison leave in 2003, Varg hijacked a car at gunpoint. Upon his subsequent arrest, 13 months were added to his sentence. But he was ultimately released on parole in 2009 after serving 15 years of the 21-year sentence. That doesn't sound like maths to me, but I'm not wearing a Sherlock Holmes hat, so maybe I'm not sure how to do Norwegian maths. Yeah, it's different. Yeah, yeah, their numbers have like lines through them and shit. In 2014, a French court charged Varg with inciting racial hatred and defending war crimes on his blog. He has a blog. Feel free to check it out. They imposed a $10,000 fine and six months suspended prison sentence for blog postings that allegedly glorified war crimes and promoted discrimination against Jews and Muslims. Police allegedly found racist and anti-Semitic material on his computer as well. So, you know, that's, that's, that's not how we make friends. Casual racism. Yeah, I don't know how casual it was, but yeah. Anyway, he now lives in France with his wife and six children. In 2015, he released his own tabletop role-playing game named My Farog, which is very catchy. You probably think it's a Norwegian Oh, My word. Farog. My Farog. We were oh. playing that just a minute ago. Um, it stands for Mythical Fantasy Role-Playing Game, which is described on its website as being a role-playing game based on European values, geography, prehistory, mythology, traditions, and morals, and will offer you the opportunity to play a game in accordance with your own European nature. Wow. Yeah. Uh, sounds uh, like racism to me. <laughs> it's a racist board game. It's a racist potentially. board game. I don't know. Look, the friend I spoke to who knows about this stuff, he was like, yeah, no, nah, it's not the same. It's not the same. I looked into his blue eyes and he went, it's not the same. It's not the same. <laughs> Look, I, um, I don't know enough about it to really completely understand where that line is, but it's certainly, um, it, it, let's just say it drifts across. Uh, Norwegian death metal. It's a thing. Yeah, it's actually Norwegian black metal, though. Uh, black metal, I sorry. think it's this case that made everyone think it was called death metal. So that was kind of interesting. No, that's great. Yeah, poor dead. Poor dead. Poor dead. Um, yeah, anyway, um, glad that I looked into it. What do you got? Well, uh, this one's sent in by a listener, actually. Yeah. Um, by a listener, Michelle. Thank you very much. Though the main protagonist in this is also named Michelle, so I'm hoping Michelle's think she's just the not antagonist. sent in your own deeds. Yes, <laughs> Michelle sent in a story about her own crimes. Well, actually, she just said the name, didn't she? She just said that's some serious crazy yeah. shit. Check it so, out. So, um, yeah, this is about Crazy Shelley. Crazy Shelley. See, that sounds like a fun person to me. That sounds like, hey, the party started. Crazy Shelley's here. Is it a fun story? It does sound like Crazy Shelley would be a fun person to hang out with, mm -hmm. but no. No? No, she wasn't a fun person to hang out with. Well, maybe they should have given her a less fun nickname. It's false advertising. In 2003, a teary-eyed Megan Notek, that's with a K, she's 19, she wanders into a Raymond County police station. She states police should arrest her mother, Michelle Notek. Um, she reports a long list of abuse of torture leading to murder with her mother at the centre. Ooh. So, Michelle Notek. Okay, please tell me she didn't just poison people, though. She I didn't poison people. Aha! Yeah. Okay, good. Michelle Notek was born in 1954. Um, when she was a kid, her alcoholic mother abandoned her to run off with a boyfriend, and then her boyfriend beat her mother to death three years later. Ah, well, that was obviously a great choice, Mom. Yeah, Shelley blamed her dad for her mother's death. You know, you shouldn't have divorced her um, kind of thing. Yeah. Ah, oh, okay, so he, okay, he shouldn't she, have divorced her. Um, um, all right. Yeah, she went sure. a bit nuts and um, started telling lots of lies. She actually reported her father for raping her, which was proved later to be a lie. Because it was consensual? No, because it I, never happened. Uh, okay, that's that's actually better for my soul. She, she ends up marrying young and has a daughter, Megan. Mm, and shortly these after, always have daughters. Yeah, shortly after the birth, the husband leaves. Um, she mar remarries and has another daughter, Dana, and again the husband leaves. Oh, wow. It's kind of becoming old hat at this point. It Break is. Break the routine. She settles in Raymond, Washington. Raymond is a city in the Pacific County, Washington. Um, the population is about 3,000. The town's That's economy... Yeah, the town's economy has traditionally been based on logging and fishing together with a limited amount of tourism. Though apparently they grow a lot of pot there now. Really? It's been decriminalised. Oh, um, okay. Well, yeah. I was just thinking, why would anyone go there? But you've given me ideas. But you anyway, know how much I love Iggy Azalea. Not at the time of this crime. 
Apparently, it's not easy to find um, locals with anything good to say about Michelle. Crazy <laughs> Shelley is described by relatives and acquaintances as flighty, schizophrenic, evil, volatile, temperamental, and an oddball. Okay, so schizophrenic stands out as like a diagnostic word. Did they ever actually diagnose her? No, that? Not, not that I could find. But also the word oddball doesn't imply that things are about to get real mean. It's like, oh, oddball. You know, like she wears different, like one different shoe of each yeah. pair. That doesn't sound too I think, crazy. I, I think evil's um, evil? pretty yeah, accurate. That's a good one. Yeah. She, okay. had a, she had a talent for manipulating vulnerable people. Michelle was sometimes charming but with a scary temper. One minute she was nice, the next she would turn on you. Uh, Michelle Sounds step- like my old boss. Yeah, Michelle's stepmother said Michelle told wild lies and had angry outbursts. She told everyone in the family that she had cancer once. Oh, whoa. Uh, okay, but, oh, fake cancer. Why do fake people cancer. do fake cancer? Is it for attention? That comes up a lot in when we it talk does. about um, psychopaths, doesn't it? I think it's because they probably want sympathy from people and they're such like raging assholes that they're not going to get it any other way. Yeah. So, like, you can't hate me for being super cunty because I've got cancer. Yeah. Maybe. I still hate you. Yeah, I know. Well, you can hate me. I just meant, like, but oh. I've got cancer, Barney. You can't hate a cancer victim. No, I still hate you. Yeah. Well, yeah. That's what real friends Tra- do. Tracy Flynn of Raymond said, Michelle was extremely persistent when she stalked her after a minor fender bender. Michelle wanted Flynn to pay for car repairs, even though police couldn't determine fault. She followed her, called constantly, showed up at Flynn's work and her mother's home. Wow, she stalked her mum too. Yeah. Wow, that's a bit intense. I know. A good friend of the no youngest daughter stayed at their house uh, frequently. She never witnessed the mood swings or fits of rage that earned Michelle the nickname Crazy Shelley. She said Michelle was always friendly around her, but her friend would become fearful when it was time for her to leave and go back home. Ah, uh, okay. She mm. doesn't do it in front of other people. That's right. In the mid-80s, she meets David Notek, a Vietnam veteran. Oh, um, what a coincidence. They have the same name. Is that, is that why no, they together? No, I couldn't find um, <laughs> Crazy Shelley's um, maiden name. Her maiden surname is Shelley and her first name is Crazy. Oh, well, there you go. Thank you. David I'm Notek is helpful. a Vietnam veteran um, and he has a weak personality. Shirley uh, Notek, Dave's mother, said before he met Michelle, he was dumped by another woman. He was on the rebound. He rebounded with crazy. Don't um, rebound he, with crazy. He was sad and Michelle was friendly. He, um, She soon demands his paycheck in full every week, allowing him a small allowance. Um, she would constantly demean him in public. Oh, well, that's not nice. Mm. After a while, he was her tool. Her tool? He sounds like um, a bit of a tool. She weaponized him, basically. Right, okay. So how much allowance do you think he got? Uh, what was know. he allowed to buy? Chewing gum? Yeah, maybe a buck. A dollar, a dollar a week to buy presents for Shelley. Yeah. Okay. He stayed because of the girls. He's a loyal man, said his mother. Now, this is when um, Kathy Lorino comes into the picture. Are you keeping up with this? Um, yeah, so far. Okay. Kathy Lorino, by all accounts, um, she had endured an in- a difficult life. She was only 19 when her father died, electrocuted on the set of a movie. Oh, what movie? Zapped. <laughs> That's not true, is it? No, that's not true. I don't <laughs> was know. It Cujo? I don't know what movie it was. was okay, well, but I know Scott Bayo was in it, and it was about some telekinesis. And and Scott Bayo did it. Yeah, that's when Kathy and her mother moved to Pacific County. Um, Kathy Lorino became a hairdresser, working for a time at Bobby's Beauty Bar in South Bend. They give the best perms good at Bobby's perms. Beauty Bar. Good perms. We should go there and, and get they do his a and good hers. shave too. Yeah, maybe they could fix your mustache. Maybe they could. Those who remembered her remembered um, a happy person who was quick to share a smile. At the time, um, Lorino started dating a man who, whom her mother did not like. Lorino's mother also warned her daughter, daughter to stay away from Crazy Shelley, well, um, if they'd given her a more whom she had nickname. befriended. Okay, why would she? Oh, okay, because Shelley sometimes seemed like really friendly, and it was only when you're behind closed doors that she. Ah. Uh, Okay. Exactly. Her mother was just trying to do what was best, but it backfired and um, Kathy left home. She began living with the no Tex in 1989. Oh, that's not going to be a good idea. Michelle was pregnant with her third daughter um, and Kathy offers to stay and help and becomes their live-in full-time nanny. Why would you do that? Uh, that's a shit gig even if Michelle isn't evil, which she is. You wouldn't clearly. just invite Fran Drescher into your house, would you? Um, um, well, I wouldn't. But oh God, that voice is so annoying. Oh, God, the laugh, the oh, laugh. Oh, let's move on. Please. During- oh, no, you should do all the rest of it in the nanny voice. Oh, no. Mr. Shafty. During her stay at the Notex home, it's alleged that Lorenzo, uh, so, uh, Kathy Lorenzo, suffered physical abuse. In 1994, Lorenzo um, 
Lorino, sorry, I keep getting that wrong, was reported missing by family members. When interviewed by authorities, the no-text stated that Lorino had run away with a truck driver and moved to Hawaii. Oh, well, well that's nice. Um, she even had a photo of Michelle and the driver with a big rig in the background. Oh, that's lovely. I know. Michelle Notek maintained that she and, and Lorino were in regular contact. However, a private investigator hired by Lorino's brother concluded Ooh. that she'd probably been murdered by the Notex. Yeah, that's, that's the probably. kind of story that we hear here more than the fun holiday stories. Okay. So, Kathy's there and she goes missing. Why did she stay there? Now, there were other children at the Notex house as well. No. Yeah. There was Shane Watson. Okay, why was Shane Watson there? And well, he's a child. How old is he? uh, He's about 17, 16, 17. Okay. Okay. Um, Shane Watson was born June 6, 1975 and was Michelle uh, Notek's nephew and had been living with the couple during the same time as Lorino. Shane's grandfather had been murdered and his father, an outlaw biker, was in jail. Wow, there's a lot of murder on the periphery of this family. There really is. Also, his mother was a drug addict. Well, you know, by comparison, yeah. that sounds almost preferable. He had no place to go. Oh, poor darling. I think maybe, like, the streets would be better. Yeah. Um, so the abuse from Crazy Shelley begins with small things, um, like sabotaging homework. So oh, she'd okay. take half their homework out of their bags, and then they'd, they'd fail. And then when they told their mum they'd fail, she'd laugh at them and call them stupid. Oh! Oh, that's nice. Did she put? Well, this is like it's minor stuff. So she put like like salt in the sugar bowl. Yeah, that's annoying. Yeah, crazy Shelley strikes crazy again. Crazy Shelley. Um, she'd slap them around. Um, she'd lock them in closets for hours on end with stale and rotten food to eat. Um, that's a, oh, that's a bit Teresa Nor, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Um, the kids would try and stay away from their mother when she went into these rages. Yeah, um, she would uh, often wake the children at five a.m. In the middle of winter, I make them run outside in just their pajamas and hose them down ah. and make them roll in the mud. Um, if you're gonna act like pigs, then I'm gonna treat you like pigs. Wow, she's like a black guy. Is she a black guy? <laughs> I don't know where that <laughs> is. That what came you're saying? From. This is kind of like some twisted mummy dear. If you're stuff. going to act like pigs, then I'm going to treat you like pigs. You sound like a walrus there. <laughs> Was she a walrus? <laughs> yes. Oh wow, that um, makes sense. They were really made to wear long clothes to cover up bruising and injuries. So when Kathy came, Kathy became the new target. She was kept half starved and made to crawl on the floor like a dog. Run, Kathy, run. Shelley would take clothes and shoes away from them and make them work naked, indoor and out. Uh, well, that's, I, don't, I, don't, I don't understand. Yeah, I know. But I she would it. shower them with affection one minute and then traumatise them the next. Kathy spent days, um, spent days kept naked in a well. In a well? In a well, begging to have the ladder lowered. Well, that sounds like a horrible thing yeah. to do. What? Uh, I wish she'd run away. She's not going to run away. No, she isn't because she's been killed by so her. So not only did she um, weaponise her husband, she weaponised the rest of the kids against each other too. Ugh, of course she did. Shane was also constantly punched and made to do star jumps in the rain in his underwear. Um, <laughs> she also enlisted Shane as an abuser. She would tell the kids to punch and kick Kathy. And one time um, she made Shane stab Kathy in the leg with scissors. Wow, she's like a puppet master for evil. Yeah. I bet those black metal guys would find her entertaining. Now, apparently, Megan, the last time she saw Kathy, she was very ill. She had bad balance from repeated blows to the head um, had, and had lost a great deal of weight. Um, she collapsed and um, David not a good way to tried to revive her but could not. Then um, Shane took some Polaroid photos of Kathy's body. Ah, oh, okay, so this is the episode where everyone's photographing dead bodies. It seems Woo. to be that way. We finally made, We finally got that episode of our dreams. Shelley gets, uh, takes the kids away and um, makes them stay in a hotel that night. And uh. she drives back to the house and picks them up the next morning. When the kids get back there the, the, the next this morning, membermint? there's a new fire pit in the backyard. Oh, that's a nice surprise. Isn't it lovely? Yeah. I wonder what happened to the old one. Yeah. Aww. Shelley uh, says Kathy had died of natural causes and they better remember that. If they feel like talking to anyone about this, she will kill the children and David and then herself. She should start with herself in this scenario, don't you think? Yeah. That's my vote. Do I get a... No. Shortly after Kathy Lorenzo's disappearance in 1994, Shane uh, seemingly uh, vanishes as well. Uh Uh-oh. The Notex initially claimed that Watson had run away to Alaska to work on a fishing vessel. Well, it sounds like a better idea than staying there. Hmm. 
well, this is what Megan and Dana think. These are the eldest daughters. They escape. That's good. Oh, thank God someone's going to escape. They run away. Oh, thank God. Okay, good. Good, good, good. Yeah. Now, Crazy Shelly's got all these empty rooms now. Crazy so Shelly. Crazy Shelly's bargains. <laughs> Crazy Shelly's bargains is going to need a new border. Crazy Shelly's bargain rooms. Uh, Ronald, You'll never leave. So this is where she befriends Ronald Woodworth. Ah. He's 57 and was known around town as a strange man who had several brushes with the law. In 2001, court documents show Woodworth got in trouble for check fraud. Yeah. Also that year, four people applied for an anti-harassment protective order against him. Four? Imagine harassing four people to the point where they want yeah. to get something out. That's that's a full-time job. One neighbour said um, that Woodworth often hid in ditches and jumped out at people. <laughs> well, that'd be annoying. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Ronald. Oh, Ronald. Okay, it's here's not a, funny or clever, Ronald. Oh, let me tell you a little bit about Ronald Woodworth, Woodworth here. All right. Um, yeah, he grew up in California. He served in the Vietnam War. Um, he attended the University of uh, California at Berkeley and was an expert in Egyptology. Oh, well, that's interesting. Yeah. He was no dummy, said a family friend. There was nothing stupid about that man. Well, there was something stupid about him. Yeah, well, we'll get to that. All right. But many who knew Woodworth said his behaviour grew erratic over the years and his hygiene faltered. What, like he got sort of dementia or something? Sounds like that. Most people conclude he was mentally ill. Okay. So he might have had early onset, you know... Dementia? Dementia, something like or that. Or something. Okay, so he he got oh. progressively odder is what you're telling yeah, me. Yeah, he couldn't keep a job. He ran out of money. Um, he got busted for trying to pass bad checks, as I said. Mm. And um, after he met Michelle Notek, they began spending a lot of time together. No, mm. no, 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 no. Don't no. do that. Woodworth um, moved in with the Notex in late 2002. Later, mm. he's elderly. I hope he likes being down a well. <laughs> yeah. Later, his elderly mother had to get a restraining order against him because he was stalking me, watching me, watching every move I made, she said. He stalked his own mum? Yeah, he seemed to be upset with her for not taking care of his two cats. Cats? He sent her angry, profane letters. Mum, you bitch. Fucking feed my cats. Why didn't he feed his own damn cats? They need to be fucking brushed every day, you know. Don't you know that? (laughs) Mr. Whiskers looks like he hasn't been brushed in a day. Uh, Mom, okay. Still, Catherine Woodworth uh, blamed Michelle Notek for inspiring anger in her son, saying um, she had a hot temper. Woodworth meant, went missing in 2003. How, the mum or the son? Uh, the the son. son. The, the son. son. Ronald. Right. Okay. Yeah. He just disappeared. Did, it, did he go to Hawaii or Alaska or somewhere else? No, kind of interesting. I don't think they even bothered making shit up. With, he didn't with run him. away with a long haul truck driver? No. That sounds like a nice <laughs> romance. Uh, like Kathy. Ronald was also subject to severe physical abuse. Witnesses described seeing um, Ronald being forced to do chores outside, wearing only his underwear. It seems She's to kind be... of obsessed with people doing naked chores. And to jump, f- and uh, uh, someone reported seeing him jump from a second-story roof onto gravel, wearing nothing on his feet. Apparently, that caused broken bones and severe oh, lacerations. He they, miseried himself. They also claimed that Michelle Notek would burn Woodworth's injured feet with boiling water and pure bleach. The fucker, that's that's harsh. Oh, and also, if it's his feet, right? This is this he, he got miseried. It wasn't a sledgehammer, mm. but like you can't really run away if you can't. Use well, your that's feet. right. You can't use your feet unless you are really good at handstands and you have very strong arms. So while this is all while this is all happening, mm. right? Um, this is when Megan went to the police. That's, right. Okay. This is when I first. Yes. Okay. Good. This is how I Go this Megan. Story. So the police start to act. I mean, Megan is the hero in this story. Yeah, absolutely. And she lived um, to tell. That must have been hard. So police start to investigate. They go to their house, and they, it's it's a mess. Yeah. Well, didn't she have anyone do naked chores lately? She had no one to do naked chores. Uh, so damn they it. remove um, the, her youngest daughter, Whitney, from her care. She goes to child services, which is thank God for that. Well, yeah. Hopefully, she gets put somewhere good though, because that can be a whole can of horrible worms too. Mm, but they didn't really have enough to um, to investigate any further. They couldn't search the house. Because it's like no house. bodies or anything. Yeah. They There's had no a probable cause from this. Probable cause. Yeah. Apparently not. So while they're investigating, and though I have heard some reports that the police really dropped the ball on this. Well, yeah. I don't know if that's true. Well, they just are crazy, Shelley. Someone with a fun nickname like that can't be all bad. (laughs) That's right. Just a bit nutty. But um, while they're investigating this, um, David comes to the police station drunk. Um, He's trying to get Whitney back. Oh, he's trying to get... Because there's three and the youngest is his, right? Like, blood-related. that's right. 
So, but after um, they, they take him into an a interview room and they interview him for three hours and he confesses. Oh, what did he confess to? Okay. Well, David Notek admitted to uh, placing um, Ronald Woodworth's body in a sleeping bag and burying it in their, back, in their backyard. After Michelle told him that Woodworth had committed suicide, she said he was depressed and liked to climb trees, very tall trees, and jump out of them. <laughs> oh, he's just one of those depressed guys who climb tall trees and jump out of them. Yeah, what's wrong with a cliff? Well, also, well, he I mean, doesn't have shoes. Yeah, and his feet are messed up. But if yeah. you're depressed, you're really going to have the like chutzpah to climb a freaking tree. Come on, that's absurd. Uh, Maybe he wanted to spy on his mum from the top of it. I don't know. It just well, doesn't ring super true, does it? Another thing that I haven't got here is 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 Whitney said that she didn't know where he was, but his shoes are here, and he only has one pair of shoes. Oh, okay, that's that's a bad sign, Whitney. Yeah. Anyway, so they find his body. Um, an autopsy was performed by the King County Medical and Examiner. And they find that and, he died from jumping from a tree. And they proved that his death was murder. He was starved to death and died of exposure. Oh, sh- God. Ugh. David Notek also claimed that Kathy died from asphyxiating on her own vomit, but he did not take her to hospital or report her death to police because of the physical injuries to Lorena's body. She was 36 when she disappeared in 1994. Right. See, for me, this guy's just, just as... Like, he's so complicit. He's helping this happen. He could have stopped it, and he isn't. So he's as damned as she is in my eyes. Absolutely. And that's all that matters. <laughs> David also said that he had shot Shane Watson with a .22 calibre rifle. Investigators allege that David Notek killed Watson because Michelle was enraged that Watson took pictures documenting the abuse of uh, Kathy Lorino. We only take pictures of dead bodies in this house, Shane. Yeah, no, he took the because he took the pictures of the dead body. Oh, yeah. that was Shane. Okay. That's probably why he took them. He was probably about to go to the police, and that's that was why he was killed. God, okay. Uh, David Notek also stated that he burned the bodies of Shane Watson and Kathy Lorino and scattered their ashes at the beach. Oh, the beach. Well, that's a nice detail. Yeah, they didn't find much of them. Well, they wouldn't mm. after being fully fire pitted. Did they find anything in the fire pit? Not really. Okay, I thought there might be a tooth or yeah. two. Maybe the bit that's missing from mine. Michelle Notek was sentenced in Pacific County Superior Court to more than 22 years in prison. She had entered Alfred guilty pleas. Is that when a butler does it for you? No, that's when you 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 plead guilty but you don't admit what you've done. Don't right. admit any guilt. I'm guilty but I'm not guilty. Um, they say that they they kind of convinced her that um, the jury would most likely have convicted her of second degree murder and manslaughter. But I, I think what the investigators really tried to do was their main witnesses were the two daughters, yeah, the three daughters, uh, and they didn't want to put them through that whole okay. horrible trial. So she she took this one to get less time, I guess. Yeah, the whole Alfred plea. That's that's odd. Dave Notek was sentenced to fifteen years. He early pl- earlier pleaded guilty to second degree murder in the shooting death of his step nephew. Um, they said they were fighting with the gun. Oh right, but I mean, what that was made up, or was that? Well, we don't really know. He probably just walked up behind him and shot him in the head. Well, we did. Okay. We, we don't know. I know, but if you're shot in the There's back no of the head, evidence. it doesn't really look... Oh, because of the right desecration. Okay, I gotcha. Because he burnt the body. Yeah. I mean, David Notek's the only one who really knows. Well, I don't have a lot of faith in his opinion. Yeah. Um, yeah, he just, yeah. what was it? Second degree murder and um, unlawful disposal of human remains and rendering criminal assistance. Apparently, um, his daughters still communicate with him in jail. Okay. But not with their mother because they believe any contact with her would endanger them and their families. Yeah, keep um, away from her. She's a crazy Shelly. Crazy Shelly. David Notek is due for release in 2019, so in a couple of years. Are you going to go over and, and visit him? Uh, I don't think so. No. I don't want to meet these people. I don't, no, I don't want to either. Um, so, yeah, that's the, that's the story. But there's more. Ah, but wait. But wait, there's more. There's a possible another victim. Yeah, okay. Um, James Mac McClintock. James Mac McClintock. Is that an, a certain Mac McClintock? That's a name. Yeah. His nickname was Mac. Oh, okay. Like it's in inverted commas. It's not Mac Mac McClintock. Well, that's what I was hearing. <laughs> um, <laughs> he died in Feb 2002. Um, he was 81. He was a Pearl Harbor veteran, retired merchant, crewman, and widower. He was adored by his neighbors and popular in the community. Um, Why would he be hanging out with crazy Shelley? Well, Mac put his wife, Mary, into a nursing home and had lived alone. And uh, Mac went everywhere with his black Labrador sissy. 
Oh, please don't tell me something shit happens to the dog. Mm, no, as far as I can tell, no. Uh, <laughs> um, Mac loved the dog so much that he wanted Sissy buried next to him. What, that when it died of its own death? Not yeah, like later. when I die, kill my yeah. dog. So Mac hired Michelle to care for him. Neighbours heard Michelle... Don't hire Michelle to care for you. That's a fucking terrible oh, no. idea. Neighbours heard Crazy Shelley screaming at him abusively several times. So Mac wrote a will. Imagine living... being her neighbour. I know. Oh, my God. You'd she lived on so four acres. so much nudity. Oh, okay. Yeah. Nudity and yelling. Yeah. Some people are probably into that. Mac wrote a will, leaving his estate to his dog, Sissy. Oh. And um, over $5,000 to care for his dog to Michelle, whom he listed as a friend. No, I don't know, dude, dude. That's a bad idea. So Mac had uh, willed um, Michelle ownership of his estate uh, to take place at Sissy's death. So the dog gets it all, mostly. Yeah. But dogs Until are really, the dog dies. dogs aren't good at paperwork. Like they probably don't they're realize not. that they own the stuff and they're probably not going to put in anything to stop a crazy woman from taking it from them. So Mac had several strokes and heart problems, but he got around in a motorized cart. Um, he fell out of it a few times, but um, he was never seriously injured. But on Feb 9th, 2002, he did die after falling out and someone was in the house when he fell. It's Michelle. Oh. Shelley. She called 911 to report he had fallen. Police Chief Dave Eastman said Mac did li- did live long enough to talk to deputies and did not mention foul play. Right. It was crazy, Shelley. Okay. So he didn't say she did something no. to him. Because like, she strikes me as the kind of person who, A, would do something to him or get someone else to do it, and then like wait until they're dead before you call 911. That sounds yeah. like her to me. Anyway, Michelle took the lead in handling arrangements after his death. Michelle took Sissy and um, received at least $5,000 from the estate to care for the dog. Six months later, Michelle reported Sissy had died, which she meant Mac's house. Um, did, did she kill Sissy? She got, she got uh, Mac's house valued at $140,000. Jesus, dude. Um, did she kill the dog? Now, after this is when Ronald came in. So Ronald, right. Ronald was helping her renovate this house, that she, this oh, new house. Oh, the new house, the dog yeah, house. Okay. the dog house. Now, um, the, dis- the deaf... Certificate lists the cause of death as acute subdural hematoma, blunt impact to the head, which could have happened after falling out of a wheelchair, but it could oh, have happened uh, with a log of wood across oh, the head too. Oh, and also, if you've been hit in the head, he, he might be like, disoriented and maybe that's why he didn't go crazy Shelley yeah. smashed my brains yeah, out. Yeah, from behind. Yeah. Um, a doctor who examined the body ruled the manner of death undetermined. Now, Michelle lied about Sissy's death to take ownership of their home. In fact, Sissy... An older female black lab came up for adoption when David um, released all their pets for adoption after his arrest. Oh. So they had other dogs. They had rabbits and cats and stuff. Sissy too. survived. So Sissy survived. Oh, okay. I'm happy about that. So that's a possible, uh, possibly another for murder victim for um, Crazy Shelley. Well, the story is damn crazy. Mm. I wonder, like, I guess she really picks the kind of people that she can manipulate into torturing. Yeah. I mean, she's kind of a mastermind with that because you you wonder why people would put up with it. But also, everything's possible. That's quite mind blowing. That's yeah, that does my head in. I'd like to thank non crazy Shelley for sending that in. <laughs> um, nice one, saying Shelley. Uh, I don't know, Michelle. Maybe you prefer to be called Michelle instead of Shelley. Well, uh, yeah. Well, after crazy Shelley, I'd say the nickname Shelley is probably yeah. off the table for a but, lot of people. But thanks for that. And listeners, if you do have a great murder where you live, yeah, a tip. or you know about it, a yeah, I'll off. investigate. Yeah, yeah. Particularly if it's bizarre. I like bizarre stuff. Yeah, bizarre stuff. And you will get kudos on air. Yeah, all the kudos. Ooh, baby, so much kudos. Um, wow, that's really... I'm going to be thinking about that one for a while. There's so um, many moving pieces. It took me a while to research that one, and I was glad to to do it today. Because yeah, to get... To, get, to, to not have to think about it? To not have to think about it I anymore. get like that too. It's almost like a purge when you research these for hours, and then you get to read them out. Mm. I just... Yeah, I want to forget about this one now. Oh, yeah. I'm not sure if it was Truro or another one of the quite dark, rapey ones that I did. But I remember um, there were a few things happened and we had to kind of put off when we were recording. And I'm like, I'm sick of living with these. Teresa Knorr. These assholes. Yeah, it was a Truro one because we did those Because you had to live with Teresa Knorr for like an extra week. Oh, Uh, yeah. No, that was horrible. Um, It's it's really good to, um, to move on from them. But all right, so let's do that. Um, I've got I've got an Aussie has. Oh great! It's um it's whack. It is a scorcher. 
Um, it is a scorcher. It, it actually won a, a Darwin Award <laughs> because it's it's that clever. Um, Australians are often uh, known as Aussie battlers. We got some fightiness, but this guy, this guy might have been a little misdirected. Um, so in 1989 in Melbourne, Australia. That's ra- where we live. That's where we live. Was it you? Um, a rather impressive, it wasn't you because like you wouldn't. You'd just be a pair of hands. A rather impressionable student of Kung Fu took things a bit too literally when his instructor dramatically informed the class, now that you've reached this level in your training, you can kill wild animals with your bare hands. This martial arts trainee took the statement as gospel and headed to break into the Melbourne Zoo to test his mettle with the wildest animal of all, the lion. In the dead of night, he slipped into the zoo, leapt into the lion enclosure and engaged a suitable king of the jungle in combat. He would probably have lost a one-on-one fight, but he never got to try. His naive plan didn't account for the, the lions decided, the whole pride of lions decided to just own him in one go. Um, and it also, his plan didn't give sufficient weight to the possibility that his instructor didn't know what the hell he was talking about and you probably shouldn't try to fight wild animals. So zoo employees found this guy's remains, which were two arms and hands, uh, the following morning. And um, in his hands, there was like clasped, clasped shreds of red fur oh. tightly in his dead fingers. Right. N- don't, don't break into the zoo and try to fight a lion. No, nah, it's not a good idea. Then that's, that's advice that we should all live by. We don't have any lions now at the Melbourne Zoo. Is die. that because of that? No, not because of him. No, why? No, they actually probably live longer because of him. Well, um, he was delicious. No, they died of old age. That's recent. And um, they're going to get some new lions. Oh, right. Well, I'm going to start training Kung Fu now. I'm just going to get, get myself ready. And, you know, the, the what do they call it? Agenda um, thing, you know, a company has the, 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 their points of reference. A for, com- what? You know, well, what the zoo want to do is they, they, a zoo exists for conservation, right? Yeah. And their second point is, you know, display these animals, animals to the public. Yeah. So their first thing is conservation. So they want to make sure that the habitat is just, you know, right. Right. Okay. So a lot of animals might have, you know, uh, two-way glass, one-way glass, so they, they can't see people because yeah. they don't want to see people. Well, I don't want to see people either. Where can I get the glass? So when they're putting these new lions in... They, they've got all these um, pneumatic tubes all around this enclosure. Mm-hmm. And at random times during the day, at random places, it'll shoot meat out. Oh, meat tubes. Meat tubes. Wow, okay. So, you know, the lions feel like, you know, it's more of a surprise to them. Right, because normally in the jungle, they wander around and, and, and just dead meat pops out of tubes? Well, no, I know it's not exactly. They can't exactly give them live animals to feed on. No, um, that would be cruel. Although they do it with snakes. They give them live little chickens and things. Yeah, they can't shoot a goat into there. or. Well, if they had a big enough tube. But yeah, that would be So I reckon nasty. that's pretty cool. Yeah, that's, that's kind of amusing. I wonder if they're ever like going to be in the wrong place at the wrong time and get like a bit of like, <laughs> this meat fired into their face or their butt. That would piss a lion off if yeah. you fired Rawr. a steak into its butt. I have, I have another funny lion story. Really? God, you're full of this it. This is from old Roman full times. Full of it. Um, there was this guy in old Roman times and he sold counterfeit jewellery. Yeah. You know, it didn't have real diamonds or whatever. It right? sounds like the kind of guy I'd anyway, buy stuff he got on. caught and um, the emperor said, well, we're going we're gonna to put you in in the Colosseum and the lion's going to eat you. You're going to gonna have to fight a lion. Right. And he hadn't done Kung Fu. He didn't. He wasn't. A, so he wasn't you know, looking forward to it. He wasn't a soldier it. or anything like that. He was just a con man. He's just a simple merchant. He's just a simple merchant. Mm. So um, they put him in the Colosseum and he's, you know, shit scared. And the gate opens yeah. for the lion to come out. It was like like a really pansy lion. No, a chicken comes out. A chi- <laughs> Did the chicken kill him? And everybody laughed. And he said, this will teach you to bullshit people. Ah, oh, really? That was a punishment? And they let him go free after that. Well, that doesn't sound like the Romans I know. Oh, cool story, eh? That is a cool story. Ah, oh, and that's like a happy note. We should probably quickly end the podcast before we, <laughs> before we ruin it again. We will be back next week. We'll see you. Well, 
You'll hear us next uh, week. And remember to rate, review and subscribe. It really helps us. I mean, it really does help us. It does, actually. Um, that's the kind of shit people look at. Um, also, if you want to see pictures of, um, of the people involved and the animals at times in any of the stories we tell, um, feel free to join our Facebook group, yeah, Bloody Murder and, Podcast. And look at our MySpace page. Um, look at Barney's MySpace page. It's mostly dick pics. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> bye, Tara. Bye, bye. Adios. on my head since 1997.